episode of Cheap Shots, Vintage 28mm Lenses. In today's episode, we're going to answer a few questions for you. Perhaps the biggest one is, how much better is the Nikkor 28mm AIS uh, f2.8 compared to the competition, including an older and well-regarded Nikkor H 28mm 3.5? And how does an M42 Soligar that many folks are out there using for video stack up? especially against the well-regarded Tamron 28mm f2.5 Adaptol 2. Perhaps most interestingly, what I want to know is how does a cheap $5 Albinar I picked up at a thrift store compare to them all? Keep listening, and we'll find out. First, let's talk a little about the 28mm focal length. I think most folks know that the most common vintage focal length is the normal lens of 50 millimeters or somewhere around there. But the next most common focal length is definitely the 28. Early on, 35 millimeters uh, lenses were very common wide lenses, but in the 70s, 80s, into the 90s, the 28s really reigned supreme as the wide angle perspective of choice. Of course, there are wider vintage primes. But there are a bunch of reasons why vintage 28s are a great lens to add into your bag. First off, they're cheap. This isn't called cheap shots for nothing. And 28 millimeter lenses are, in my opinion, the cheapest vintage lenses available. Well, at least vintage primes. These are often designed for landscape and they do a great job of shooting them, even at infinity. They're generally faster than zooms that cover this focal range, and they could range all the way up from, I don't know, I guess f1.4 up to f4, but most of the ones you'll find are f2.8, and since they're often used for landscapes, the 3.5 or f4 variants, which can sometimes be a little less expensive and a little bit smaller, are still sharp wide corner to corner, even wide open, and are probably worth a good look at as well. They can be a great substitute for slightly wider normal lenses on APS-C crop sensor cameras too, giving them about a 42 millimeter field of view. This happens to be a great field of view for most street photography. Often, you can focus really close up. These guys have a minimum focal distance that's usually around a foot and sometimes you could get even closer. So they're nice for product photography or what some people would call environmental macro. Even on full frame, they're not so wide that portrait features get distorted, and they're useful for group shots too. As I've mentioned before, they're easy to find. Throughout my years of shooting, I've always kept a 28 in my bag, and I've tried a lot of different ones. Interestingly, I've shot some strange off-brands, and some more common versions of the big names too. Once there was a Star D I had for a while that was just an amazing performer, and the Sigma Mini Wide isn't bad either. But any time I've ever done a test, my favorite lens in this range has remained the venerable Nikkor 28mm 2.8 AIS. I picked up mine for a steal. I think it was about 60 bucks, And I got it along with some other stuff that I was able to sell for nearly the same amount. So it really didn't cost me anything. But if you were to make an investment, you'd probably have to shell out $150, $200 to a reseller or an auction site. That lens has a great reputation, but is it really worth it compared to, I don't know, any of the ones we're going to look at today? I've got the uh, Nikon AIS at 2.8 wide open, and on the right side, I've got the same lens. However, it is uh, stopped down to f8. Wide open, these lenses have a little bit of vignetting. You can see a little bit here on the left compared to the right. If we zoom in here, I'm going to kind of a mid-range, the f8 obviously a little bit sharper than at f2.8. In the extreme distance, you can still see some pretty good detail here, even wide open in the extreme corners, but stop down to f8, this lens is just razor sharp, even at that great distance. Really make out the individual bricks here in the path, a little bit blurrier here in the extreme corners at f2.8. Now, I'm going to pair it wide open to the Nikkor H. This is the older, early 60s lens made by Nikon. Again, you will see that uh, not quite as sharp in the distance as the newer AIS lens is, but still 
pretty sharp, a little bit more chromatic aberration here. And you can see that it also has a pronounced vignette. In fact, even more of a vignette. Now I'm going to show it at F8. You can see the vignette is gone. You can compare the uh, AIS to the NICOR H at uh, 2 8, I mean at F8. You can see now both lenses very, very sharp in the extreme distance. Both lenses very, very sharp here in the mid range. And it would be hard for me to tell really who I like, you know. I think the corners may be a little bit sharper here on the uh, AIS side, but it is really, really quite close. The next lens, the Tamron, the Nikkor AIS, wide open to the Tamron. Again, the Nikkor AIS, my kind of champion lens. You can see it mid distance toward the middle of the frame, really sharp. You can see in the great distance. A little bit more contrast, a little bit sharper here. Uh, the Tamron does do a pretty good job of controlling aberration, but not quite as much contrast as on the Nikkor side. If we uh, move it to F8, obviously you, you get sharper, but uh, still not quite as much contrast as you see on the Nikkor side, even wide open. The Tamron at F8, the Nikon, um, at f2.8 wide open. It's wide open, the Soligar. This is an M42 lens. You can see a little bit more aberration, some flare. Another older lens, not quite as sharp, wide open. You can see, especially in the corners, kind of blurred, blurred out, right? Look at the difference between the street sign here the street sign here, the shingles on the home. Pretty significant difference in the corners. Now, if we bring it up to F8, a lot sharper. Some interesting rendering here. Corners become pretty sharp. But again, not quite a fair comparison. If we were to bring the Nikkor up to F8, the a Nikkor AIS lens, you know, really, really sharp. Yep, let's go back to wide open on the Nikkor and let's compare it to our next. Let's go to the Super Albinar at 2.8. And without zooming in, you could see already a big, big difference, but a much um, less contrasty, a little bit more glare prone image. As we zoom in, some detail, but not nearly as much as the Nikkor. Probably a little bit better than the Soligar, but very, very flare prone. Right? You can still you can see even at uh, two eight some of the bricks here. Now, if we stop it down to f eight, give it a second, it becomes very, very sharp. And I would argue even though the color and the rendering isn't quite as strong, um, probably as sharp, still not as much contrast, right? And it's suffering a little bit in the corners. Not quite as sharp as the Nikkor is wide open. For our next comparison, let's take a look at the lenses all against each other at F11. On the left-hand side here, the uh, Super Albinar, and on the right-hand side here, Soligar. So Super Albinar here on the left, I would have said probably did the poorest in the previous test. Here, plenty of detail. It's tough because the sun's changing a lot, so it's hard to do an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. But it's pretty close in the center. You know, as you come out to the to the edge, Soligar is a little bit sharper. Color rendering pretty similar on this. You know, if we look at the tree, for instance. Yeah, I think I still give it to the Soligar. Let's compare the Soligar here on the left and on the right. Let's look at the Tamron. So Soligar was sort of, I'll call it the winner of that last one. 
and now we have the Tamron on the on the right side really quite close very very close rendering maybe the Soligar a little better contrast here Sun is to our back but very similar lens is very similar rendering Right. Tamron's looking really nice into the corners. You know, look at the trees. Maybe slightly more detail here. Let's see uh, down here. But very, very close. I have to give a very slight edge to the Tamron. So Tamron here on the left and Nikkor H on the right. Now, again, sun was moving. The Nikkor H kind of has a really nice um, sunny piece here the sun was was shining a little bit brighter may have a bit more contrast real nice lens this Nikkor it's really quite remarkable again maybe a little bit better lighting so take it with a little grain of salt but really really strong performer is it better than a $20 lens well maybe slightly let's look at that, that so far best one, that Nikkor H on the left, and compare it to the Nikkor AIS. Again, this is sort of a medium distance landscape, uh, architectural shot. Very, very tough to tell. Again, lighting's better on the Nikkor H. Here, even at f11 to the AIS, you know, look at the difference, a little line between the, the two shingles here definition within these bricks that are way to the edge right that brick versus that brick very close but the AIS again I have to say takes the lead now we're going to take a look at barren bear scene here in the winter time um, but I have on the left hand side here the Nikkor AIS at uh, 2.8 and the same lens stopped down to f8. You can see a pretty big difference, right? f8. Here you don't see the vignetting quite as much um, as we did in the earlier tests, but you can definitely see a difference in contrast, better depth of field here on the right side, etc. Zoom into an area that might be in focus on both. Um, you know, the, the AIS really performs very admirably wide open. My focus point on all of these shots is actually going to be this tree stump out here way off in the distance. Even wide open this AIS even though it doesn't have quite the same contrast is doing a pretty darn good job. You could really see the difference in sharpness. Let's compare the Nikkor AIS to the Nikkor H both wide open. Um, white Nikkor H here on the right. Difference here is the Nikkor H is a 3.5 lens, so it is a little bit unfair to compare the two. I think wide open AIS is doing pretty much as well as the H, um, even though it's at 3.5 and we're comparing 3.5 to, to 2.8. If I stop this H, the Nikkor H down F11, you can see it is really, really sharp, even in the corners really nice. Of course, if I compare apples to apples here, the two Nikkor is shot at f11. Really hard to tell. I'll tell you though, I kind of like the contrast on that on the right side here of this uh, Nikkor H on the right. And let's compare, I think that Nikkor H was really good in this particular um, shot. Here it is at f11 on the left. And on the right, I have the Tamron paired at f11. So this is sort of apples to apples comparison. Again, very hard to tell without zooming in and pixel peeping. Maybe the Tamron is even a little bit sharper. Uh, I think the Nikkor still has it. But very, very close. Very close. I think it's pretty hard for me to tell the difference between the um, Tamron and the older Nikon. If I compare the Tamron to the newer Nikon, the AIS, which I'm doing here, you know, still, still not easy to tell the difference. I do like the contrast on the Tamron. It's not bad. Very close at f11. 
the Soligar here on the right. I think it's interesting, wide open. You kind of get this dreamy look. It might be a nice effect that you want to use. Um, here it is at F8. Here it is at F11. Not much of a difference between those two. Nice sharp lens. Here it's compared to the AIS at F11. Not losing much that this uh, Soligar is even, uh, you know, it's very, very close. I, I, I would have a hard time telling in this particular test. Uh, let's now look at the Super Albinar here on the right. Wide open, another flary, flare prone rendering here, wide open. It's not a fair test, of course. If we go into a fair test now, we compare it to the Nikkor AIS. Also pretty darn close. You know, I guess what I'm saying here is if you're stopping these down to F11, F8 in that range, it becomes very, very hard to tell the difference, even when pixel peeping, between this, which is a $5 lens on the right-hand side, and this, which is a $200 or even you know somewhere in that range 150 somewhere up to 300 dollar lens on the on the left here we have an interesting test this is a close up the food photography example can't apologize this is dinner tonight it was not that appetizing looking but i think it gets the job done here what i'm looking at first is the uh, super albinar and um, on the left-hand side, I've got it wide open. On the right-hand side, I've got it stopped down to 5.6. Uh, what I like about this lens gets pretty close, not the sharpest. I'm, I'm focusing in here on the little seed in the tomato. Not the sharpest wide open, but stopped down a little bit. You know, it's not bad. Wide open, nice bokeh, stopped down, still very nice. It's circular looking. You know, if I look at it um, on this big specular highlight here, not so bad, stopped down. This lens suffered a lot outside from glare and issues, and inside, I think it's doing a, a pretty good job. The next lens I want to look at is the Soligar. So here they are wide open. You know, the Super Albinar on the left, the Soligar on the right. If we zoom in, I think the uh, Soligar has maybe a little bit more contrast interesting looking these the highlights the bokeh kind of wild both pretty you know similar i think the bokeh a little bit strange here on the soligar but but not unpleasing very smooth nice in the background if i stop it down a little bit and compare them uh both stop down at five six uh, i think you start to see now a pretty significant difference though that soligar is very very sharp some of it is depth of field because it, it doesn't get quite as close as the Albinar did, but sharp stop down, it's a pretty darn sharp lens. The downside is because of the way the aperture is set up, you get this kind of crazy sawtooth bokeh in situations where that lens is stopped down. So it's even at 5.6, the um, Albinar on the left hand side, very nice and smooth. The Soligar has that. that kind of strange sawtooth bokeh. This, the Tamron actually gets closer still. And I think this one's the closest focusing so far. This is it wide open and I'm comparing it to the wide open Super Albinar. And, you know, I gotta say, Tamron wide open is just not that sharp. It's, it's a 2.5, it's the fastest lens in this mix, but it's not the greatest uh, in terms of, of sharpness. You can see a big difference here compared to the outdoor tests. Boca's kind of cool, you know, it's smooth, it's, it's nice, but um, the sharpness just isn't there. If I stop it down to f5.6, and I'm gonna do the same here on the uh, Super Albinar side, uh, and then zoom in, you're gonna see that it really, really shapes up nicely. Um, and it becomes a very, very sharp lens at 5.6. Gets up close. Boca, eh, five blades, not the best there. Not as bad as the sawtooth, you know, not quite as, as appealing in my opinion. Um, but it is a very nice, uh, nice sharp lens. 
Let's put it on the left-hand side. Um, I'm going to put the uh, Tamron, um, which so far is our closest focusing lens. And on the right-hand side, I'm going to try the wide-open Nikkor H. Whoa, look at the difference there. Um, zoomed in on the tomato, you can see what a difference. And this is because of the minimal focal distance on this lens. The Nikkor H, the oldest lens in the bunch, it's from the 60s, and it's a two foot focal, uh, minimal focal distance. You might look at that and say, well, and the others are one foot, by the way, they're about. You might say, well, what's a foot? Doesn't make that big of a deal. Well, this is why it makes a huge difference. Stopping them down, you see the vignette disappear, right? Big vignette, here it is again at f2.5, uh, at f3.5, which is wide open on the Nikkor. And here it is at 5.6, the vignette disappears, but you still can't get any closer. I'm gonna go back now to the Tamron, which is the closest focusing that we've had. I'm gonna look at it wide open. And on the right-hand side, I'm gonna look at the AIS Nikkor, which I assume is gonna be the winner. Um, and it is, right? Here it is, you can see how much closer to the subject you can get. And if we zoom in on that little seed, it's closer and it's sharper than the Tamron. The highlights, bokeh, very nice, interesting looking lens. If I stop it down, and I'll do the same thing on the Tamron side, right? If I stop it down, it just becomes ridiculously sharp. Still better depth, more shallow depth of field because you're closer to the subject. It is just astonishing um, stop down. This is a beautiful product shot. This is probably the the distance, the focal length I would I would use if I was trying to maybe take a more appealing looking lunch or dinner and, and, and make it into a menu item. No question about it, the big winner here, the newer Nikkor, the AIS 2.8, gets close, super sharp, amazing lens for product photography. Nikkor AIS is the lens you want if you need great sharpness wide open and are shooting close up or have the money to spend. The Nikkor H is a great alternative if you're looking for a landscape lens and can stop down just a tad to get rid of the vignette. The Tamron is just so darn good stop down and it's a much better option than the Nikkor H if you really need to shoot close up from time to time. It wins if the Adaptol 2 mount is a benefit to you or if size is really important because this is a small one. The Soligar is really cheap, M42 and is way sharper than I expected. I think it might be a Tokina, but I'm not 100% sure. It's sharp indoors without that glare, but the Sawtooth Boca might be something you need to consider. And what about the cheapy Albinar? Well, it wouldn't be my first choice, but you know what? For a few bucks, you could get some really nice results, and if that's all you could afford. Remember, individual lens variation and even the quality of the adapter you're using could have a substantial impact on outcomes, so take these results with a grain of salt. While none of the lenses really overthrows my current champion, the Nikkor 28mm f2.8 AIS, each has their own merits. And considering the price, you might prefer the older Nikkor or even one of the other third parties if you could find an inexpensive example in good condition. As I've said, I've tried 28 millimeters from Canon FD mount Pentax M in both 2.8 and 3.5 and even Minolta 2.8s. Even when looking at all those third party lenses, my Nikkor AIS really still landed on top. However you slice it, you'd be very hard pressed to find a 28 millimeter prime in good condition that isn't usable. So grab whatever one you've got and make some great cheap shots.